good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dan Maud, the president of the National Academy of Engineering. You see, you can always tell how important you are by the length of your introduction. <laughs> oh well, you have to take it when you can get it. Well, I'd really like to give a welcome to all of you for coming. This is, a, this is actually a really great day, by the way. I mean, much greater than you probably think. Got people who are new members. We have, we have people who want to be members. We have people who are, uh, are w waiting to hear the conclusion of the reviews. And we have those who are just thinking about the whole thing. What am I going to do? And so it, this is just the way it's supposed to be. This program really should be bringing everybody together once a year to expand this space of Grand Challenge Scholars Program interest from just thinking about it to already having a well-operating uh, well, uh, unit. And actually, coming to this thing is really one of the only ways there is to find out about the whole thing, actually, because there are a lot of rumors and a lot of different points of view and so on. And uh, the, the, the program is a lot more complicated and interesting than you think. You know, people are always telling me, well, we have the sustainable development goals. We don't need the grand challenges. That is missing the point entirely, by the way. So th the point is I, I'm hoping to help you understand a little bit about what the program is so you'll be able to see that more clearly yourself. Because it's not just a list of things to do. It's actually a change in culture. It's a, change in, a way of changing thinking. And I want to make sure you see that. Uh, we, we, we really, uh, uh, in, in these remarks, if, if you allow me, I want to start sort of at the beginning and kind of go quickly through this. So the beginning might be, um, what is 20th century engineering? And uh, that's an important question here when we try to understand this program. So you can describe all of engineering in four words, okay? So it's not actually that complicated. It's creation, it's solutions or value, either way. It's people, society. Those four words describe all of engineering. And, uh, and therefore, uh, if, if you're uh, an engineer or if you've been educated in engineering, you have been educated on those four issues since they're the foundation of engineering. Now, if you look at um, 20th century engineering, what you find is that, in fact, it didn't actually educate engineers in those four areas. As a matter of fact, it educated engineers in, in creation and in solutions, but not so much in people and society. In fact, not so much. That was sort of left to humanists and other things, that, the electives, you might say, in your program, by and large. Now, it's true for, not, obviously not true for everybody, and I'm sure people have counterexamples, but by and large, it didn't really focus on People didn't focus on society. In fact, most people in the, in the United States, at least, don't think engineers do anything uh, for people. They don't think they're interested in people at all. So that's uh, kind of missing the target, right, you might say. So uh, then uh, uh, enter the, the question of 21st engineering, 21st century engineering. And uh, what's happened in the 21st century of engineering is engineering has moved to complete the picture. It's now creations, solutions, or values, and people in society as well. So people in society have moved into the real definition of engineering has now taken hold. And that's a big shift, a big change. And one of the stimulators of that is the Grand Challenges for Engineering that, that were published in 2008. <laughs> and, uh, and, and this was a very interesting uh, and uh, complex uh, initiative where the, the committee, it was a very distinguished international committee chaired by, um, by the former Secretary of Defense, William Perry, uh, it, was, it undertook the question of what does engineering need to deliver for the planet? They came to this question themselves because they tried to, to figure out, they were given the charge of trying to say something about what, what engineering should do in the 21st century. And they came to this question, what should all of engineering do for all of the planet? 
So then they, they spent uh, quite a bit of time trying to fig figure out, okay, if this is the question, uh, what should be the vision statement that we would have that would essentially answer this question? What are we going to do? And they came up with a vision statement, in effect, that you could describe in 15 words. It was um, continuation of life on the planet, making our world more sustainable, secure, healthy, and joyful. Basically, it was a planetary vision about essentially moving the planet in one direction that in four areas, sustainability, security, health, and quality of life, if you were. So that was a big shift. And that was, by the way, the first time there's ever been any, ever a vision for the planet at all that I can find. I've said this as many times as I can remember talking, trying to find somebody to give you another example of a vision for the planet in history, but no one has yet come up with one. Secondly, it introduces people and society into engineering. That's the first time that engineering moved from the 20th century into the 21st century. Now, the vision for engineering is, is not just the, the, the technical sides, but it's also the humanistic sides as well. That's what happened in, in, in that vision statement. So once it had the vision statement, uh, basically continuation of life on the planet, making our world more sustainable, secure, healthy, and joyful, then of course they had to figure out what, what are the goals that are required to reach this vision statement? What has to be done? How do you get there? What, what's, what's the solution mechanism to, to get to that state? And, and of course, once you start to look at goals, they looked at goals, they, their original idea was to get this down to 10 goals. For some reason or other, they thought 10 was a nice number. But uh, they couldn't get it down to 10. But they could get it down to 14, 14 goals. Now these 14 goals are complex, uh, multidisciplinary, engineering systems, all of them. And of course, these goals are for the planet. That is, they're not just goals for the United States or for some country or some part of some country. They're goals for everybody. Now, this is kind of a big issue. And you might say, you can't think of a much bigger problem than that. And of course, the 14 goals, you know, uh, are termed the grand challenges for engineering. That, that's where the grand challenges come from. So the grand challenges are really goals, when satisfied, will achieve the vision statement of continuation of life on the planet, da da da, 15 words. That's what, those, that's what the grand challenges are. They are goals for a vision statement. Now that kind of gets lost. Most people don't, don't seem to know that or if they haven't heard it, they don't remember it. So, so sometimes you hear people want to exchange, uh, you know, we're tired of this 14, I don't like this, I don't, I don't like worrying about uh, you know, uh, fusion, energy from fusion, I, I, I'd, rather ha I'd rather do something else, all right? I don't want to worry about uh, you know, virtual reality, enhancing virtual reality, I want to do something else. Well, uh, if you're going to maintain the vision statement, of course you have to have that area of the vision statement covered if you're, unless you're going to change your vision statement or walk away from it. So, so anyway, the, the, that was the, the vision and goals as it were, were the, uh, the vision statement and the, and the 14 grand challenges or the goals, those were the outputs, outcomes of the original study committee that Bill Perry led. And they didn't talk about actually how to implement them. They, they just, here, here's the vision statement, basically what I said, and here are the goals. Here are the grand challenges. Um, and it was just a National Academy of Engineering report, by the way. It wasn't a big NRC study. It, was, it wasn't uh, widely uh, published in big magazines or anything like that. It, it was a, a, an academy study as well. So uh, then the, the, uh, the next idea was actually a critical one, especially to us here, and that there, was th there were three uh, uh, people who raised the following question. They said, well, if this is where engineering needs to go in the 21st century, shouldn't we start students thinking about these? You know, nice, clear, simple questions like that are where everything important happens. 
So that, that was, of course, uh, Tom Katsalaos and Janis Jortsos, and Tom was the Dean of uh, Engineering at Duke at the time, and Janis is still the Dean of Engineering at USC, and, and Rick Miller, uh, who is the president of Olin College, they're all here, of course, and they were pals at USC a long time ago, and they were talking, talking together with this question, and they decided that we really need to get students to start thinking about, or being, shall we say, prepared for working on grand challenge type topics. And, and so that started the whole movement towards the grand challenges for engineering, which ultimately were actually announced a, a year later. So in 2009, the, the program was announced, and the, the grand challenges themselves were published in 2000, 2008, so it happened very, very fast. And then it has gone through a process of, of growth uh, all, all over this whole period of time. Uh, now, the, um, the grand challenge focus uh, really brought in the, the, the global, uh, brought in this, this global vision of su sustainability, security, uh, health, and quality of life. And uh, it was basically a supplement, as you know, a supplemental program to a, a, a regular engineering program. And, and, the, it, and it came down to uh, uh, an idea which I thought initially, I have to admit, uh, was impossible to start with. I, didn't, I couldn't see how you could create one program that would be acceptable to every engineering program on the planet. I, you know, in the, in the United States at least, two engineering programs that are across the street from each other in different colleges are, can't, can't go across the street. They're not acceptable by the next one for any, any number of reasons. Why? Now we're gonna have a program that'll be acceptable to everybody. Oh, I thought, this is not gonna happen. It sounds impossible. But it was very cleverly done. In fact, it's not impossible. And what they did was they focused basically on the, the, the vision statement of the grand challenges, basically the, you know, the, uh, the 15 word vision statement, which said you're basically talking about sustainability, security, health, and, and, and quality of life issues. So they, they brought in pieces that would in, ensure being able to uh, address those as well. So the, the uh, competencies, basically, so a university, all of you, you, can, you have a program, if you essentially put together a program to uh, deliver five competen competencies in your students, as I think you probably know and have done already as well, and those competencies are chosen, actually, if you think about them carefully, they're chosen to bring in these missing pieces from engineering from the, from the 20th century. The, the, the pieces about people and society. They're, they're basically about talent, of course. You need a talent piece. You get some experience in talent. Uh, multiculturalism, that is, this has to do with your solutions. That they're going to be around the planet, as we said. Therefore, they're going to be in different cultures. Therefore, they have to be effective in those cultures. So when you create a solution, it has to work in the culture you want to implement it in. Now, this sounds like fairly straightforward, right? And fairly obvious, but in fact, this mistake is made all the time. People, it, it, you know, U.S. people tend to think everybody works in American cultures. I mean, it's a kind of silly uh, thing to think about, but that's what normally happens. And the other countries have a similar problem. So this now is telling undergraduate engineering students you have to think about the culture where this is going to be implemented so you know if, if this would be acceptable there for any number of reasons. Multidisciplinarity is part of this. These are engineering systems, these are complicated engineering systems. They're going to have lots and lots of disciplines in them, a lot more than science and engineering. They have all kinds of stuff in them. And the students need to start thinking about these disciplines when they're creating these designs, because now they're really starting as undergraduate students working on complex multidisciplinary engineering system problems, right? So, so this, is a big, this is a big leap as well. Then, of course, there's a, a, the issue of social consciousness. This is about what you're doing is about serving people and society. It's a social conscious decision. Once again, this brings people and society into the picture very sharply. That's a, that's a big transition for engineering. And that's why that is so important, because it ensures that that gets in there as well. And, uh, and of course, there has to be a viable business model here. That is, if, if you don't have a viable business model, then your solution will not be in, implemented. And that viable business model has to be viable in the place where it's going to be implemented. If that's Bangladesh, if that's Berlin, if that's Beverly Hills, they, they, they're gonna be different 
business models for those locations, even if you want to do the same thing. So, so this is bringing educating you know, undergraduate level students in a, in, in a very advanced level in, in terms of thinking and preparing them for uh, their future in the 21st century engineering. I have to tell you, when I, when I told uh, Dennis Muhlenberg, the president of Boeing, uh, uh, about these five competencies, he just slapped his hand on the table and he said, this is exactly our problem. I want every one of our employees to take this pro program. This is, we have a huge problem here. This is it. So that gives you an idea how different it is and, and how important it is. So when, when international companies who, who have these problems because of the fact that work they do in different countries and in different cultures and so forth, uh, they see how, how important it is for, for the educational program. So, but in one way, this uh, educational experience in these five competencies uh, really takes a, a page out of the Analects of Confucius because, uh, and, and it's really important to think about. You know, Confucius uh, said, um, among many things, uh, he said, uh, I hear and I forget. I read and I remember, but I do and I understand. So these things are about doing, not about reading and not about hearing. You know, like for example, you can have a lot of lectures on uh, multiculturalism and you can, you, can, uh, you can write a paper on multiculturalism and you could go to a few lectures on it and so forth, maybe even get an A in your paper. But if you haven't actually engaged in a multicultural circumstance, you don't really understand it. Basically, you don't understand it. You haven't had a chance to understand it. You haven't had a chance with the conflicts and all the adjustments and stuff, working in a multi. So you have to, you have to be engaged in a multicultural environment. And that's where uh, the importance of having uh, international relations and having Grand Channel Scholars programs in different countries, this will give an opportunity for all the students to have, have a, a, an experience, an authentic experience in another culture and have to get an understanding of how these, this multiculturalism issue works and why it's important and why you have to consider it and, and all of that sort of thing. It's true for multidisciplinary as well and so forth. So, so it's really important. So basically, uh, the 20th, 21st century engineering education really brings in people and society into, into uh, basically the, the, the creation of, of solutions as well. Now, the students like it, I, I have found, and you can tell me if I'm wrong on this, but that, uh, the students like it uh, as well, I've, I've heard, at least they tell me. One is they, they like to focus on people and society. They like to bring in the social issues in there. And of course, it's attracted a lot of, I think, uh, female students into the program. Over half of the graduates are females. And I think it's because it uh, has a lot of social consciousness in its programming by intent. Uh, it, it's uh, it's imp the importance of uh, culture uh, really adds a viability to the program as well. And that's, uh, that's a, an acceptable issue, highly acceptable issue. It thinks about complex systems, and complex systems require teamwork. Business communities are very big on the, the, the possibility that students will have a teamwork experience on complex problems. Uh, it considers economic solutions, you know, uh, for its viability. So it has a lot of these really big features associated with it in very simple words, but they have big impacts, and they're big features, and they, and they have big intent. So even though it looks very simple and very straightforward, it's only five things after all, you know, Actually, when you start thinking about the detail of them, it, they're very, very impacting. So, um, the, uh, the, the National Academy of Engineering's role here. Well, this is, the National Academy of Engineering's role is, is, is really important in the sense that we are just a facilitator. We have, we have the idea and we're facilitating your engagement. We're trying to make it so you are excited about it and you want to do it, and you need a hand here and there, and we can help with, with the facilitation. But we're, we're not owning the program. We don't own the program. The program does not belong to us. The program belongs to you, actually. So we just facilitate. Each university, each program owns its program. In fact, that's the only way this can work. It cannot work any other way. Each university, in whatever country or place they're in, 
they own their program. They choose the students. They decide which students they're going to have. Who, who are the students? Are gonna, what are the conditions for the students? They decide that. They choose the students. They educate the students. They decide whether the students have achieved at a certain level determined by them on these five competencies. And then they recognize the students in a way that's appropriate for them. And that could be having a big celebration. It could be ribbons on their degree. It could be all kinds of things. It depends on the university and what they, what they want to do and how seriously they want to take it. It's up to them. And they'll be a, expected to be a, a large range of difference there. And that's just fine, by the way. That's just fine. We want people to engage, and, and we want them to own their program. If they don't own their program, it won't succeed. It'll be nothing but conflict. So they have to own the program. And uh, that, that's really, uh, that's really, impo really important. We're not st steering away from <coughs> owning the program because, but only because it's impossible to own the pro for us to own the program. It, it, it would do nothing but create a mess for you, you know, because no, no uh, program in, in some other place wants a U.S. C academy coming in and running their program. I mean, that's a silly idea, right? So, really understand that this program is yours. That's it, yours. And we're, the, we're here to help you make it work better for you and your students. That's all we want to do here. We want you to do it, <coughs> and we want to help you do it, <coughs> but that's, that's where, that's where we're, we're in this. Uh, we're in this, see this program grow, because this basically is an important program and it needs to grow. Uh, and uh, we're going to facilitate that, the growth of the program the best we can internationally as well as nationally. Now, the program is not restricted to engineering students, okay? It is not restricted to engineering students. You can, the, each university can invite to its program any students it wants to. In fact, it's not restricted to undergraduate students either. You can introduce graduate students. In fact, University of Texas at Austin, when they created their program, it was open to every student on the campus graduate, undergraduate, engineering, not engineering, anybody who wanted to, who wanted to sign up for it, they were allowed to join the program, okay? Uh, and that's fine. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. And the, you're not violating any rules. The only rules are you have to, they have to have competencies in these five areas. That's it. And that's what your program needs to do. Now, I just talked to somebody from the Uni University of Arizona today, and I was reminded of the fact that a couple of years ago, I went to... I went to Tucson, and, and I was invited by chemical engineering department to talk about the Grand Challenge Scholars Program, and you know, to try to sell them on the Grand Challenge Scholars Program, of course. So I accepted, naturally, and I, I was there. And, and while I was there, I noticed the crowd was a little bit bigger than that. There's probably more people there than there are here. And, uh, and there were a lot of people who were beyond the chemical engineering. And it turned out that uh, it, it even involved an associate provost in charge of the undergraduate programs the whole campus at the time. And before I left that, that uh, meeting and talk, uh, they told me they're, they're gonna create this program and they're gonna create it for the whole campus, all the students on the campus. So in, just in the period while I was there, that's, that's what I heard. Now they're still working on that, I understand, but they're still, that, that's the direction they're heading right now. So give you an, just give you an I, I, idea of what the options are here for you to think about uh, your program. Uh, we just have, by the way, the first community college, Montgomery College, is here today. The, they just got uh, a, their program approved, so it's the first two-year college that's had a program approved, and they've put together a, a framework for other community colleges or two-year colleges to have their program. So that'll be a start of another expansion direction for the program as well. All these are very, very positive, uh, very positive steps. So. Uh, other things we, we want to do, what the Academy wants to do, it wants to build connections uh, between Grand Challenge Scholars programs. That's one of the reasons why you're here, because you can share information, and therefore you can each, everybody can help each other, and you, you can build some regions. We want to engage industry in the Grand Challenge Scholars program, because first of all, the in industry would be in interested in a lot of the students in your programs. Industry would also provide opportunities for some engagement in different experiences uh, that, that would be good for the talent side of, the, of this as well some engineering experiences there. So there's a lot of reasons why we'd want to get industry uh, associated with this. Um, the program has really maximum flexibility. If you look at it carefully, you'll notice that in the, among the five competencies, 
There's only one that has anything to do with the grand challenges. That's the first one, that's the talent piece. You need some research or mentored research experience on a grand challenge-like topic or something like that, right? That's what that says. Now, let's say you have a program uh, that uh, you're not, you don't have a, you don't want a grand challenge-like topic. Maybe you want a different topic. Maybe it's some ag agriculture topic of some kind that doesn't seem obviously in the list. Well, you just change the talent piece to an ag agriculture type topic and the rest of it's all the same. So in other words, what I'm saying is this program, this grand challenge scholars program maps any program basically into a global one. All you do, if your talent, if the talent piece doesn't fit your needs, you just put your needs in where the talent piece is and you've got a, a, a global program. Your national program has been mapped into a global program. That's, that's where the real power of this program is. It's very flexible, very strong, and very adaptable, very, very adaptable. And uh, the, this annual meeting, I think, is a good idea because it gives a chance for people to ask questions and, and go back and forth on issues and get ideas from others on how to solve tricky issues that, that arise. And you'll hear s successes and not so successes at, at, at the same time, and th that's all good advice. So I think we'll continue this annual meeting, of course, uh, as long as people w wish to come. And, uh, and at the same time, we're gonna be expanding the program. Our first round of uh, initiative goals is to get about 200 US programs, about 200 international ones, but that's just the beginning. I think this, there's no reason why this shouldn't continue to grow going forward. Um, so basically what I'm trying to tell you is the Grand Challenge Scholars Program is really about <coughs> looking at engineering differently. It's not just a list of rules of some kind. It's look at how you look at engineering differently. Basically, engineering now includes people in society in engineering as well as you know, creation of solutions. It's really a basic definition of engineering is what it encompasses. That is different. And that is also preparing our students to work in the 21st century because that's where all industry wants to go. That's what industry is looking for. That's what the world is looking for. And, and most of our Edu undergraduate education programs are not preparing students for that. They're preparing students really not for global, the, the global experience. That's what this program does as well. And if you add in the, uh, the uh, international experiences that your students can get as they fill out this, they will expand that global experience. So it's uh, global people and society in addition to needs and creations, that's it. So it's a culture change. It's not same old, same old. And thank you very much for putting your efforts into this and being part of this. And uh, I would be pleased to ask, answer any, any, any questions I, I might if you have one right now. Otherwise, you can go out and start celebrating before you start. <laughs> So if you're brave enough to raise a hand, uh, we have a mic that'll float around and uh, make it easy for you to ask questions. Hello, my name is Ted Andrenny and I'm from uh, College of Environmental Science and Forestry at the State University of New York. I remember last year your address, you had pointed out that Engineering might not have a strong motto to tell society exactly what we do, and you'd given an example that uh, medicine can say we you know, cure disease. I might be misinterpreting that message, but I think that was somewhat along the lines. You just laid out four words of creating solutions for people and society, and I'm curious to know, have you thought about using that as the byline for engineering? Actually, I use it all the time. I, I, uh, I, 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 the only part I can, the, the only reaction I can give you though is I'm the only one that seems to use it. <laughs> <laughs> so if I got two or three people out of this audience that use it, that would be good. <laughs> that would be good. I feel successful. What really, what really makes me sad actually, I go on the internet and I look up the definition of engineering and I get these tomes of writing of various organizations and stuff go on and on, line after line. Uh, half a page descriptions. And it's not about engineering, it's about a particular aspect of some engineering pr 
program and so forth. You know, if you're, if you're an auto, automotive guy, it's all about cars, and if you're an aircraft guy, it's about planes and so on. So that's the problem with engineering. It's, it's such a big topic and the spans is so much, it's hard to get it down to, to the essences. So I, I'm the one that actually got it down to these four, four words, which is the essence of engineering. And of course, it happens to be just linked up very well with the Grand Challenges as well, and the Grand Challenge Scholars Program as well. So, hey, why not? Thank you for the question, by the way, and, and, and your support. I can say now there may be two people using it. <laughs> uh, anybody else have a question they'd like to uh, waft? Thank you. Uh, my name is Miles Robinson, NC State College of Engineering. Um, I was curious, that, you know, again, kind of the byline uh, that you're referring to, and some of the ABET student outcomes uh, that talk about uh, working in teams and thinking about problems in society and, and uh, working across disciplines. I'm curious, what if at all uh, the ABET student outcomes kind of had an impact on this, or did, are they totally independent? You know, I, I don't feel fully qualified to, to answer that question since I don't really track uh, ABET myself. So I, I can't really tell you uh, whether it's had positive, negative, or no impact uh, by ABET. All I can say is that I've never actually looked at ABET, so I don't even, uh, I didn't actually construct this with any uh, information I got from ABET. And uh, I, would, I would hope that they're quite similar uh, because I, I don't see how it could not be, but uh, uh, I don't, uh, I feel unconstrained by ABEC at the moment, because I, I, like, different from you, I don't have a program I I'm trying to get approved. <laughs> <laughs> I worried about it when I was in, uh, running the University of Maryland. I come from a family of blacksmiths. We came to call ourselves metallurgists. Al recognizes the term. But, you know, the public looks as engineers as plumbers. They have a leak. They call a plumber to fix it. Engineers in our contemporary society, when something needs to be fixed, they call an engineer. I think today, in the 21st century, we are the enablers of implementation of science for society. We're like the catalyst. Doesn't necessarily interact in the reaction, but it makes it happen. Yeah, I, the only, the only uh, I, I don't disagree that, with that entirely. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think you're, uh, you're really cutting engineering much too short on this, by the way. Engineering is much bigger than what you said. You know, if the Egyptians had waited for science, they never would have had pyramids. If the South Sea Islanders had waited for science, they never would have navigated the oceans. So engineers do a lot of things where there's no scientific principles involved. And it, engineering is not just a, it doesn't just suck up the science, by the way. It's not trailing along behind science and asking for what, what it should do. Not at all. Engineering leads the way. And, uh, and it's always been that way, and it's always going to be that way. So. Uh, that's my view about this. <laughs> well, maybe I'll let you drink for a while now <laughs> and eat. Um. Thank you, Dan, for the inspiring message. I just have a few logistical announcements and also a at a personal note, I'd like to say something. So uh, those of you who are here who are uh, looking to start a program, uh, you may want to look for people who say committee on their badges and also staff members. So you can ask, uh, these are the steering committee members and they're identified by their badges, so you can please interact with them and find out what they're looking for in the proposals, et cetera. Uh, and then I saw already many of you are uh, putting uh, your ideas on the ideas board there. So please continue to do that uh, during the reception and also uh, all of tomorrow. So we'll capture those ideas and, and then use them for our closing uh, session tomorrow as well as going forward in uh, refining this program. Uh, and then uh, finally, the, all the steering committee members 
and the students and the alumni, uh, I request you to please stay here and come to the podium uh, for a group photograph with uh, the president of the academy. So please uh, do that. And then finally, on a, on a personal note, I, I'd like to say a, a couple of things. Uh, you know, uh, many of you know that the past six months has been uh, very tough uh, for me from the health reasons, and I appreciate all the you know good wishes and uh, keeping me in your thoughts. I really appreciate that. I want to personally thank you. Uh, many of you are here who have sent me uh, wishes and uh, cards and so on and so forth. Uh, I'd like to you know particularly uh, single out a group of folks and. Uh, and a particular person as well for that purpose. A group of folks are my colleagues at NAE. Uh, they have been extremely understanding and supportive and you know, always making sure that I don't overextend myself and all these things and keeping track of my taking rest and so on. So I really appreciate their uh, being a pillar of strength and uh, unwavering support through all the six months. I've been just transitioning back in, into the academy. In fact, you know, Al uh, Romig, our executive officer, uh, told us that, you know, I'm happy, I'm happy that uh, Rama is back in the saddle, but you know, one thing that my doctor told me is that don't go riding any horses. So that's, <laughs> that's the one thing he said, don't do it. But finally, there's one person particularly that I want to th thank here, and unfortunately he's not here with us. Uh, he's Proctor Reed, and uh, he he's, was taken away from us uh, prematurely this a uh, few months ago uh, as the director of the National Academy Programs, uh, NAE program office, and he was, um, you know, uh, always very supportive and always thinking about others' uh, well-being and health, and in the process, he apparently neglected his own well-being and health, and he, he had left us uh, in, in July, and I would like to really thank him for all the support he gave during the time I was recovering. And so now, as I mentioned, please stay here for the photographs, the m committee members, students, and alumni, and the rest, we can uh, move to the Great Hall for the reception. Thank you.